Hi, I'm Katie Stone. Welcome to Dystopia. This is the fourth in a series of videos designed to open new pathways into the genre for those unsure where to begin, or for the hardened dystopians out there to offer an opportunity to return to first principles, try and work out what drew you to dystopianism in the first place. There are more learning resources, reading lists, exercises and ways to get more involved in my website at katiemcgregorstone.co.uk But for now, however much time and energy you have for this today, you're welcome. So this is the second video, it's part of a pair of videos that I'm doing on utopia, the relationship between dystopia and utopia how we can see dystopia both as a critique of some kinds of utopianism, utopianism where the good place that is imagined, the utopic place, um, is bordered, is contained, is nostalgic, is conservative and hierarchical, um, as well as uh, looking at the ways in which utopia and dystopia might work together, might be complementary and how there might be ways of getting to better worlds through imagining worse ones. Uh, for this text, as in my, uh, for this video, as in my previous video, um, I'm going to be discussing Octavia E. Butler's 1993 novel, Parable of the Sower. Um, and for a re brief recap, for those who need it, um, Parable of the Sower is set in a near future California um, where a combination of climate crises, rising inequalities and privatisation of public services um, have led to a, a society in chaos where some people like our protagonist, Lauren Olamina, and her family have retreated into gated, fortified communities, which they do not leave unless ab absolutely necessary. And even then, they leave together and they leave armed. Um, so Parable of the Sower tells the story of uh, Lauren's life within this community and beyond it. And in particular, um, it tells the story of the religion that Lauren founds, invents, discovers um, to help her combat these, these dystopian times. Um, the religion which she calls Earthseed, which is founded on the principle um, that God is change, is transformation. So she's very invested in the possibility of transformation. So as I've already argued, I see this as a, as a dystopian text, which is really about, about utopia as well, about the attempts to make better worlds, even when things seem really dire. And I'm going to be going into that a little bit more today. Um, so I'll be looking at Butler's novel, Parable of the Sower, but also using illustrations drawn from Damien Duffy and John Jennings' graphic novel adaptation of um, Parable of the Soul, which I think gives really good visual accompaniment to Butler's words. Um, just a note at this point to say that Parable of the Sower does contain graphic depictions of violence, sexual violence, violence against children. I'm not going to be talking about any of them in this video, but if, you, if you're hoping to pick up the book, which I really highly recommend you do, that's just something to be aware of. That's my example text, and it's the one that I'm going to be, be using to, to ask this question of what is a utopia. I'm suggesting that before, we, before we're able to work out what is a dystopia, um, which I see as the central goal of these, of these videos, um, we need to work out what is a utopia. Um, and do dystopias just critique utopias, just critique the attempts to create good places in the world, to imagine good places? Um, is that always a doomed project which will only lead to totalitarian states um, or, or naive, uh, nostalgic efforts um, to go back to nature and back to the golden age, the good old days? Um, or is there a possibility of creating a dialogue between utopianism and dystopianism which would be about radical transformation? Um, so to do the 
guys, to have this conversation, I'm going to be taking a deeper look at Tom Moylan's Scraps of the Untainted Sky, which I, which I mentioned in my previous video. Um, this is a book which I highly recommend. I think it's, it has difficult elements to it, academic elements, um, but large parts of it are very readable. And I think Moylan does a great job of giving an introduction to some really difficult thinkers and ideas, including people like Frederick Jameson, Lyman Tower Sargent, Darko Suvin, Raffaella Baccalini. Um, he gives a really good overview of a kind of radical political tradition within science fiction studies, utopian studies, dystopian studies. Um, and it's just an excellent introduction to the field as it's being discussed within academia, so within universities. Um, however, what I'm going to be focusing on today is really what I see as Moylan's own insights, his kind of synthesis of all these, all these other writers. I'm going to first um, offer a brief overview of what I see as his, his central argument that he's making. Um, then we're going to see how that's applied to Parable of the Sower, how that can help us to read Parable of the Sower. Um, and finally, I'm going to end from some of what I think are the most kind of striking passages and most interesting aspects of, of Moylan's work. Um, so to begin, Moylan, Moylan defines a utopia. He very much considers himself to be a utopian. And for him, this is what utopianism is. Merlin writes, Utopia names the socio-political drive that moves the human project for emancipation and fulfilment beyond that of the current system, even as the best of utopian anticipation is based in a historical and material understanding of the present. It nevertheless takes the imagination at its best imbricated with the politics of the transformation of everyday life to a place beyond what is available through accommodation and reform. It must hold that what is already being done is never enough. I think the word of utopianism, he's interested in critiquing it in various ways, different kinds of utopia that are nostalgic, that are bordered, that are hierarchical. Um, but he's also very much interested um, in the possibilities that utopianism offers as a project for emancipation and fulfillment, for the transformation of everyday life. And he puts a strong emphasis on this idea that you can't get to utopia through reform. You can't get there by tinkering at the edges of the society we currently have. It has to be about essentially revolution, radical transformation. Um, so this is what he's committed to. This is his political project. This is where he's coming at it when he's reading dystopian text. The question is, where does dystopia fit into this? And Moylan writes, although all dystopian texts offer a detailed and pessimistic presentation of the very worst of social alternatives, some affiliate with a utopian tendency as they maintain a horizon of hope, or at least invite readings that do, while others only appear to be dystopian allies of utopia as they retain an anti-utopian disposition that forecloses all transformative possibility. So here Moylan is saying that there are texts that offer detailed, pessimistic presentations of an alternative world, be that, be that a future world or just a, a different world than the one that we live in. Um, some of those are dystopian. And he sees this affiliation between dystopia and utopia because they maintain a horizon of hope. But some of them, although they might seem to be dystopian, Moylan argues that they are in fact anti-utopias. They're not dystopias at all um, because they foreclose all transformative possibility. So he goes on to discuss this a little more and he says that texts that adhere to the insistence of the usually conservative argument that there is no alternative, this was 
very famously in the UK, Margaret Catch Margaret Thatcher's um, watchword was there is no alternative to capitalism. Um, and that seeking one is more dangerous than it's worth, run up to the limit of anti-utopia and risk transforming what begins as a dystopia into a full-fledged anti-utopia. In contrast, those progressively inclined texts that refuse to settle for the status quo manage to explore positive utopian possibilities by way of their negative engagement with their brave new worlds. So here again, we have we have this idea, some visions of the future as a bad place or the visions of an alternative world as a bad place just encourage you to be happy with what you have and to believe that this is what happens when you try and change the world. This is what happens when anyone tries to intervene and, and create something new and beautiful and great, um, something utopian is that it will go wrong, it will become totalitarian, it will become a nightmare. Um, this, for Moylan, is anti-utopia, whereas dystopia are those texts where you see a bad world, um, but in that world you see people who are still trying to create change. So even though some you know, utopian efforts have gone wrong, uh, that doesn't mean that all utopian efforts will necessarily go wrong. And you can see people, even within these kind of hellish landscapes, still trying to create change. And he sees that as, as where dystopia and utopia meet. So I just want to move on now to how this, how this plays out within Moylan's reading of Parable of the Sower, because I haven't just put these two texts together because I think they work well together. There is an explicit connection. Uh, Tom Moylan writes about Parable of the Sower, um, and he writes about it as what he calls an example of a critical dystopia. Um, so a lot of his writing is inspired by the critical dystopias, and he sees Octavia Butler's writing as a really key example of that, as a dystopia which is really closely connected to his utopian po project of political transformation. Um, so this is the context of the critical dystopia as Moylan sees it. He says that in the 1990s, remember that Parable of the Soul was published in 1993, in the 1990s a discernible and critical dystopian movement emerged within contemporary science fiction and film that at its best reached towards utopia, not by delineation of fully detailed better places, but by dropping in on decidedly worse places and tracking the moves of a dystopian citizen as she or he becomes aware of the social hell and, in one way or another, and not always successfully, contends with that diabolical place while moving toward a better alternative, which is often found in the recesses of memory or the margins of the dominant culture. So this is the kind of writing that he's interested in, um, that critical dystopian writing. And he doesn't say that critical dystopias, he doesn't say that in the 1990s suddenly everyone was doing everything differently. He doesn't say that this is a, a hugely, hugely new thing. He says that this was always a part of dystopian writing, but it's become more explicit. Um, so this is what we want to see. If we take this approach to the critical dystopia, if we want to read um, Parable of the Sower, not just as a dystopian work in general, but as a critical dystopia in particular, what does that do to our understanding of the novel? So to discuss this, I've taken one scene, um, which is a conversation between Lauren um, and her childhood friend, Joanne, who have grown up in the gated community together. Um, and this is a scene where Lauren starts telling Joanne um, about some of her beliefs, beliefs that she's largely kept private up until this point. So even though they live in this gated community, Lauren is a real, a real student of everything that's going on in the world. She's very interested in the news. 
Um, and we have here represented um, by these, these newspaper clippings some of her studies of a measles epidemic claiming lives in New York, a cholera outbreak along the Mississippi, 300 killed in southern tornadoes, a deadly Midwest blizzard. Um, so this is the kind of conditions of crisis that the particular dystopia they, they live in has, has arisen from in their gated community. And Lauren wants to emphasise this to Joanne. And Joanne initially seems to be on board. She says, I know, I know, things are bad. My mother is hoping President Donna will start to get us back to normal. But for Lauren, this is the wrong tap to take. She says, no, Joanne, things are changing. People change the climate of the world. The old days aren't coming back. So she's warning Joanne away from this kind of utopian nostalgia. Um, and in She's encouraging her to learn how to survive. So this Joanne asks, why do you want to talk about this stuff? We can't do anything about it. She's very, she's very depressed um, and pessimistic about their ability to change the world. But Lauren says we can get ready to survive what's going to happen. She says we look at the bad things that happen in the world in order that we can learn from them. She hands Joanne, for example, this wilderness survival guide. Joanne says, so what? Learn to eat grass and live in the bushes. She's sort of provoking her, saying, you know, do you want us to go back to nature? Back to living in the wild, as it were. Um, and Lauren says no, but she is interested in learning whatever we can that might help us survive. She says, I think we should all study books like these. I think we should bury money where thieves won't find it. I think we should pack emergency grab and run packs in case we have to get out in a hurry. Hell, I think a lot of things. And I know, I know that no matter how many things I think of, they won't be enough. But we can all learn more than teach one another. We can stop denying reality. Um, and this this really is is what um, Lauren is is most insistent upon um, is that is that we should we should no longer uh, deny reality um, that we should look dystopianism square in the face and even though we won't ever be able to be fully prepared um, we will use use our knowledge. Uh, to come together and form community. Um, she offers Joanne a book on plants used by indigenous peoples, something she deems entertaining, interesting, non-threatening. Read this, take notes. And Joanne says books aren't going to save us. To which Lauren replies, nothing will save us if we don't save ourselves. At worst, you know something you didn't before. At best, it helps you survive. So she's not saying that this is this is the end. This is the answer. This reading um, by itself, it doesn't help. It doesn't nothing. Books aren't going to save us. Um, but what Lauren is insistent upon is that this kind of learning and this kind of reckoning with how bad, how dystopian the society they live in is. Um, is part of resisting it, learning how to change it. I think it's interesting, Joanne's rejoinder here. She says, I don't believe you. Things don't have to be as bad as you say they are. She seems to think that that's, that's kind of against what Lauren's saying. But actually, that's exactly what Lauren is saying here. She's saying things don't have to be as bad as this. It's not inevitable. We can change it. Um, that's what she offers, not anything that seems like a, a, a magical gift that's immediately or easily going to transform anything, but just the possibility of change. And I think it's really interesting here that this conversation happens over books, um, over the question of what use is reading. This is something that, that Moylan points out about the critical dystopia, that it's quite self-reflexive. It's really about what's the, what's the point of writing a dystopia? Um, what's the use of writing 
if what you're doing really is trying to change the world. Moylan writes that critical dystopias teach their readers not only about the world around them, but also about the open-ended ways in which texts such as the one in front of their eyes can both elucidate the world and help to develop the critical capacity of people to know, challenge and change those aspects of it that deny or inhibit the further emancipation of humanity. So he's suggesting that, that these, these critical texts, these dystopias, um, offer two possibilities. One of, of elucidating the world, of bringing it to light, of showing you how bad it is. And then not stopping there, right? Because that's part of the problem with the anti-utopia, that you just stop on the bad vision of the world and say, look, we can see how bad it is, but what next? And what Tom Moylan says is that next is challenging and changing those aspects of the world. Um, and Moylan was writing that in 2000, and I think he's, interestingly, like Butler herself, um, been very prophetic in, in this regard. He's he uh, was one of the, um, the first people within a kind of mainstream academic context. Lots of people read Butler's work at the time, um, but she's only grown in popularity. Um, so we see here this headline from 2020, author Octavia Butler reaches New York Times bestseller list 14 years after her death. Um, you can see these various kind of literary projects um, regarding her, the Octavia Butler Legacy Network, which is determined to keep her legacy alive, the collection um, Octavia's Brood, science fiction stories from social justice movements, which came out in 2015, which using Butler's work um, to inform activism, to inform writing about activism, uh, New Sons here, which is original speculative fiction by people of colour and and New Sons, the title is taken from uh, Butler's words, which are, there is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. Um, so we can see here in the work of Asia Marie Brown and Autumn Brown, Walida Imarisha, Lionel George, Nisi Shul, Toshi Reagan, um, that Parable of the Sower fits into an ongoing legacy of black feminist activism. Um, it's not just a book. Right? It's, not, it's not just a, a text to be studied. Um, it's something that to various degrees can and has been put into practice. Um, and this is really, I think, that the, the hope that Moylan derives from dystopianism, why he thinks it's useful. He says if a reader can manage to see the world differently, she or he might just, especially in concert with friends or comrades and allies, do something to alter it, perhaps on a large scale or ever so slightly, perhaps in a singular deluge or maybe through steady drops of water on apparently stable and solid rock, so as to make that world a more just and congenial place for all who live in it. Or... Butler puts it in Parable of the Sower, belief initiates and guides action, or it does nothing. So I think this shows how, how Moylan's insistence on, on this kind of critical dystopianism, which is still oriented towards the creation of better worlds, um, is really relevant to, to Butler's writing, and I think to, to dystopianism as a whole, to the question of why it matters. Um, but I'm going to move on now um, to some other aspects of, of Moylan's work, um, because he's very interested in what were then very new writers writing in the 1990s, these exciting texts. But he's also interested in the history um, of dystopianism. And uh, in particular, he draws attention uh, to this very early text, novella written by E.M. Forster called The Machine Stops. So it's published in 1909, which is kind of before dystopianism really took off. This is a kind of proto-dystopia, a dystopia before dystopianism. Um, and this is 
the story of a world where people live almost entirely underground. They lead very heavily automated lives. So all of their needs are serviced by this machine. And it's a machine that no one yet living um, really understands anymore. And the story uh, takes place at a time when the machine is stopping, it's breaking. So this is very pessimistic vision of the future that technology offers. Um, and it ends in, in crisis, in calamity. So I'll read from the ending of the story now. It reads, As he spoke, the whole city was broken like a honeycomb. An airship had sailed through the vomitory into a ruined wharf. It crashed downwards, exploding as it went, rending gallery after gallery with its wings of steel. For a moment they saw the nations of the dead, and before they joined them, scraps of the untainted sky. So this is where the words scraps of the untainted sky come from. And even though this is a, this is a vision of catastrophe, um, Moylan sees in that final phrase um, some kind of utopianism, some kind of hope. He writes, even as Forster foregrounds his apocalyptic horror at the unravelling of the world he knows, the nations of the dead, right? He clings, at least in his closing paragraphs, to the prophetic possibility that one day humanity will again prevail. And I think this opening out of possibility, this idea of there being a space beyond the dystopian world, that it doesn't touch everything, that it's not totally all-encompassing, um, is really central to Moylan's understanding of the dystopia. And you can really see it show up, I think, in, in Parable of the Sower, where Lauren is centrally interested in those scraps of the untainted sky, in the night sky and the, the vision of stars, of outer space, of new suns, which it promises. This is from a, an early part of the novel, um, where Lauren writes... The big Anglo-Japanese cosmological station on the moon has been detecting new worlds for a dozen years now, and there's even evidence that a few of the discovered worlds may be life-bearing. People speculate about intelligent life, and it's fun to think about, but no one is claiming to have found anyone to talk to out there. I don't care. Life alone is enough. I find it more exciting and encouraging than I can explain, more important than I can explain. I think people who travel to extrasolar worlds would be on their own, far from politicians and business people, failing economies and tortured ecologies, and far from help, well out of the shadow of their parent world. So she sees this possibility um, of a life beyond the dystopia that she knows in space. And she writes this into Earthseed. Um, so here's an idea coming to Lauren. The destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars. My birthday gift, just two lines. This idea to herself is her gift. It's true, of course, it's obvious. Right now, it's also impossible. Even rich countries are selling off their space projects. I don't know how or when it will happen, but there's always a lot to do before you get to go to heaven. So these ideas are obviously tricky and complicated. The idea of a, of a heaven, the idea of uh, finding salvation in, in outer space, in what can easily become a colonial project of, of dreaming of a new world um, is complicated. But I don't think that you have to buy into that, into the, the nationalist space projects of the, of the 20th century and the space race, um, or in our current kind of capitalist commodification of space um, that we're seeing now, in order to be interested in this possibility of an earthly heaven, right? uh, 
and heaven where you don't have to wait until you die, where it's not about whether you're deserving or whether you followed a set of rules in order to get there, um, a heaven that you can create for yourself. Um, and I think this image of uh, the, the gated community, this is the wall of the gated community with barbed wire at the top of it. Um, this is where Lauren has spent her whole life within the confines of what for her is really the edges of the world. Um, yet beyond it, she can still see the sun. Beyond it, she can see scraps of the untainted sky. Even in this dystopia, um, those scraps are still visible. So I think that, that more than anything else, that's what this, uh, this possibility offers for her. The destiny of Earth seed is to take root among the stars. So I'm going to leave you now with one final line from um, Tom Moylan. Um, this is his writing on the critical dystopia, and I think uh, it really offers offers something special in uh, in the way of of an examination of of what critical dystopianism for him offers. He says the critical dystopias burrow within the dystopian tradition in order to bring utopian and dystopian tendencies to bear on their exposés of the present moment and their explorations of new forms of oppositional agency. Considered in terms of the continuum of utopian and anti-utopian pessimism, they tend to express an emancipatory militant critical utopian position with their epical scope of nascent political challenges to ruling systems open endings that look beyond the last page to other rounds of contestation and realistically utopian possibilities lurking in the iconic details of their alternative worlds the critical dystopias do not simply come down on the side of an unproblematized utopia or a resigned and triumphant anti-utopia, albeit generally and stubbornly utopian, they do not go easily toward that better world. Rather, they linger in the terrors of the present, even as they exemplify what is needed to transform it. So, this is what I think dystopianism can offer if we read it with utopianism as well as as a critique of utopianism. An encouragement to, to linger in the terror of the present world, to go hard into the better future um, and to see those two projects as, as intrinsically connected. As I said before, there are more learning resources on my website at katiemcgregorstone.co.uk. Uh, but for now, thank you and you're welcome. <laughs>